Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and I am extremely excited today to be joined by John Sheridan. He is the man who is the expert on Gretsch. John, how are you? Hey, Bart, man. I'm doing well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this is going to be really cool because Gretsch is one of those companies that has just always been at the forefront of drum technology and pushing things forward. And uh, I mean, they are a classic brand that I know very little about, and I'm excited to um, to learn more about it. I mean, all I know is is they are 136 years old. That is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And they still have their own teeth. Yeah, exactly. They still they got a lot oh. of teeth. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I think we should just go ahead and start with the beginning of the history because we got a we got a long history here for this company. So why don't you um, just take it away and start at the beginning? Okay. Well, um, well, the company was founded by Frederick Gretsch, and uh, he was born in 1856 in Mannheim, Germany. Uh, he came to America at the age of 16, which would be 1872. And Frederick opened his own shop in 1883 on Middleton Street in Brooklyn, which is the Williamsburg uh, section of Brooklyn, which is a part of Brooklyn. I mean, it's, it's right on the East River, and it faces the, the lower east side. But he opened his own shop in 1883, and uh, the focus at that time was building drums, banjos, and tambourines, basically anything with a head. Because what you know he would do is that he would buy the skins from local... Uh, these, you know, slaughterhouses and, yeah. uh, and he would tan them on the roof, you know, the building. And, you know, he was very hands-on. I mean, he had people that were working for him. He had, he did have a, have a small crew, you know, but, uh, you know, within a decade or so, I mean, you know, he was definitely making, uh, inroads, uh, in, uh, in growing the business. But unfortunately on April 28th of 1895, um, he died of cholera oh my God. Um, at the age of 39 during a trip to his native Germany, uh, which is you know unfortunate for the family. But uh, his eldest son, Friedrich Sr., who was only 15 at the time and still in knickers, um, he, he basically uh, took over the company and, uh, and with the help of his mother, uh, Rosa, you know, helped uh, you know, keep things afloat. You know, they, they just kept it going. Uh, by 1916, they had to expand the business uh, into a 10-story building that's 60 Broadway in, in Brooklyn that they, they had built. Because by the turn of the century, they were the largest uh, uh, music wholesaler in the country. I mean, they were, they were, just, they were just killing it because they were, they were also uh, doing a lot of importing and, and exporting. But, uh, you know, they, they, there were a lot of brands from overseas. So they were kind of like a jobber. You know, also yeah. at that time they were they were just kind of like just a big distributor, and and so they were able to uh, you know service uh, a lot of um, uh, dealers, I guess back then, you know, or, or small music shops. I mean, you know, back yeah. and, and back and, and back and, and back then, I mean, it was like it's horse and buggy. Oh yeah, deliveries, you know, yeah. So, I mean, really, Am- like they, Amazon didn't exist at that point. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I mean, and 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 not and, and cars were not really in wide use as of yet either. So, yeah, uh, it was <laughs> really, you know, so you just, you just kind of imagine, I mean, these are, these are the old days. So. Yeah. Well, okay. So 1916, just to clarify, we're in Brooklyn. We just moved to the, uh, 10 story building, um, right. mm-hmm. at 60 Broadway. Are we primarily, I know you said we're distributing, um, from importing goods. Are we doing mainly drums now and tambourines still, or have they expanded oh, yeah. into, oh, okay. Yeah. So it's prime. So Gretsch, is drums from the beginning. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And, and and but they like I said they they were they were carrying like a lot of other instruments uh you know from other um you know from other like smaller companies and uh and and distributing them. I mean like even photograph needles and and things like that, you know, like just, wow. just like all all kinds of things, you know. So um wow. Who was their competition at that point? Uh, well, I mean as far as uh you know, I mean Ludwig uh, was still in their infancy. I mean, they were, yeah. they started in 1909 and, uh, and their big thing was the, the drum pedal, but yeah. I know that they quickly advanced into other things, you know, um, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not the Ludwig expert. Sure. <laughs> so, no. Uh, yeah. You know, and I believe smuggling came later. Well, I know that, uh, Rogers started in 1849, but, hmm. okay. um, but I think primarily they were making drum heads, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, pretty much the same way Gretsch was making drum heads. Um, but I, I do believe that uh, 
later on, I think maybe by the 30s, um, I mean, I'm not absolutely sure about this, but I've, I've heard they were supplying uh, drum shells to, the Gretsch was supplying drum shells, shells to Rogers. Interesting. Okay. So, yeah, so that's, um, I mean, I can't prove that. You sure, know, it's yeah. It's something that I've heard, so. Well, that's cool. Um, you know, food for thought, whatever. So. Yeah, no, it's interesting to just kind of put it in perspective to see what's going on. And I mean, no one was ever yeah. alone in this, uh, in the endeavor to be the biggest, you know, drum companies out there um but right right so yeah yeah but i mean like and, and at this point like the the drum set i mean was you know like in its infancy too i mean it's uh, oh yeah like that kind of happened a bit later you know but i mean you know drums were being made of course i mean these bass drums the snare drums of course you yeah know? um like in 1918 uh, fred gretch senior he develops you know the revolutionary multiply drum lamination process which resulted in the creation of the uh, world's first uh, warp-free drum hoop. Um, wow. Okay. And then, uh, and then by uh, by 1927, they uh, introduced the the industry's first multiply drum shell. Uh, so that was kind of a big deal because traditionally, you know, drum shells were, you know, they take um, a solid piece of wood, steam bend it into a circle, and then glue reinforcement rings inside the top and bottom so it would maintain its shape. You know, but yeah. uh, but. But they actually came up with staggered plies in 1927, which is pretty much the way just about every drum company, you know, makes drum shells now. Yeah, and that's – so they guaranteed – I remember seeing some catalogs where they guarantee that the drum mm. will not warp. And I guess at that point in time, for you to guarantee mm. something to not happen means that that's happening a lot to a lot of drummers. So that's like, a, mm. hey, if I buy this and I invest in this drum – it's not gonna mm-hmm. go warping on me, and the heads won't fit. So that had to be a, a huge deal when that when that came about. Yeah, and the thing is that sometimes when you know drums are like drum shells are rolled, you know, in, in the traditional sense, um, very often there's a flat spot, and it's not totally around, and so that can cause problems. And it's also been a been a belief um, by by some people that uh, having reinforcement rings inside the uh, the shell. That it can actually distort the tone of the shell, and then also, uh, it also naturally raises the pitch, you know, the, the fundamental pitch of the shell. They know all this, and it seems like they were kind of ahead of their time with the actual technology involved in creating mm-hmm. uh, what was, you know, what would become kind of the standardized drum. Oh yeah, um, so, yeah, because they, they they were building their own shells. I mean, they they, they had their their own chucks and everything, and uh, yeah. you know, those old factory pictures where you see them. You know, uh, you know, doing that back then, and uh, yeah, they were they were pretty self sufficient. I mean, you know, they they would source some stuff, you know, from other manufacturers, you know, sure. not drum manufacturers, but just like you know, uh, metal companies and things like that. Yeah. I mean, I know that for the round badges, I know that they had at least two different sources that they were getting those from. You know, yeah, that makes sense. So we should note that um, on the Gretsch website, it says in 1920, they are recognized as... Oh, the largest musical instrument manufacturer in the U.S. Yes. So they got to be doing something right. And to have to be churning out sure. that much, that many instruments, you're going to need a little help getting like the metal parts and all that. But that's uh, that's pretty huge to be... From 1883 to 1920 to become the U.S.'s largest manufacturer is, is pretty huge. Yeah. That's not even 40 years. No, exactly. <laughs> Cool. So, so we're at 1920. Then let's uh, let's keep moving forward here. Um, so, I'm seeing that 1927, which is obviously a huge year, kind of jumping around here for that's the switch of uh, trap drummers and the silent movie stuff to to get into talking movies. Um, so that changes kind of the dynamic just across the uh, the whole industry. Uh, absolutely, that uh, that very much changes things, you know. And in the 30s, that's when uh, you know by then. Uh, well, also keep in mind that Gretsch was also making banjos and stuff like that because banjos were really hot, especially in the twenties. Yeah. Um, and uh, but in the thirties, you know, I mean, by the time nineteen thirty hits, I mean, you know, you got the depression, and yep. you know, it's it's a whole different ball game. Yeah, there's talkies, but you know, but you also needed that nickel to get in the theater, you know, and exactly. um, not everybody had that, you know, so they had the use their nickels to buy frivolous things like food. Yeah, know, so. exactly, to stay alive. So with the banjo then, they're obviously competing with uh, Slingerland, who was kind of famous mm-hmm. for making banjos at first. So yeah, you're, sure. you're never you're never alone just making uh, making a product. Oh, you yeah, you sure. always have competition. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and banjos were just like incredibly hot during the 20s. I mean, you know, it was like the 20s was just like, 
that was, you know, they, they called the Roaring Twenties for a good reason, you know, because yeah. they really did roar. And, you know, uh, it was before Prohibition and all that. I mean, it was wild, you know, and yeah. uh, flappers and the whole thing. And, you know, the Depression hit and uh, that was kind of all over. Uh, but um, but by the early 30s, uh, that's also when Gretsch uh, started building guitars. And there were acoustic models at first. And then uh, they didn't start getting into electrics until, you know, a bit later. You know, certainly by like uh, I guess you know late 40s or so. You know, the the drums were you know were always the mainstay of the company, and 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 all that you know just continued to um, to progress. Yeah, I didn't going into this. I didn't know because um, I say it from time to time that like going into these episodes, I am not an expert on Gretsch. I don't know much about it until we actually talk, and then I learn, and everyone's kind of learning together. But I didn't know if drums were first. I didn't know if guitar was first. Um, so it's really no, cool. no, no, no. Drums, drums were yeah. Like, I love that. Like, pr- practically from the first day. I mean, you know, uh, there's always been drums, I mean, going yeah. way back. Yeah, exactly. So 1935, Gretsch introduces the Broadcaster series of drums. Mm-hmm. Now, is this, right. this would be considered kind of their flagship famous drum line? Yeah, yeah. It, it uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's Broadcaster, and I guess they, <clears throat> they spelt it with a K just to be different. Yep. Uh, so, um, you know, you got to call it something, so I guess... And, you know, broadcasting, you know, I mean, radio was really big at the day, and yeah. radio broadcasts, I guess that's where that came from. So, yeah, uh, the, the broadcaster line. Uh, and throughout the decades, uh, Gretsch did uh, reint- reintroduce that name uh, a number of times, and even today, as of, I think, about 2015 or 14. Actually, it was late 2014, going into 15, they came out with a, a new broadcaster line, which is a three-ply uh, drum shell versus the six ply that uh, they started making in the in the very late 50s but you know uh, we can get into that you know sure the road and um not super important but at this point logo wise we have the the older gretsch logo that has the extended t going over the curved gretsch correct just to kind of right throw yeah, in all the uh, information yeah the uh, oh you mean the badge the badge yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. right exactly yeah. okay yeah, because on on other instruments in literature, uh, there's a straight version of that. Um, uh, they weren't using that on the guitars yet, but the um, but on other literature, um, uh, they uh, they would refer to that as the T roof logo. Gotcha. Um, which so that the the top portion of the T would act as like a roof over most of the other letters. And it was just a very stylized way of uh, you know making. Uh, the Gretsch name prominent and uh, and definitely cool. So, yeah. uh, but they rounded it off when they when they started making the badge, and that's and that's also around the time that the that the the Gretsch badge, the round badge that we all know and love, uh, the '30s is really like when that badge first came into being. Because before that, they, um, uh, I mean, they did have other badges, uh, but they were kind of like, you know, more, I don't know, I guess more nondescript, um, you know. Um, they were either like plates or in some cases it was just a simple little decal, you know? Um, hmm. so, uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, yeah. And when it comes to Gretsch badges, I mean, that's certainly like a whole other thing oh, yeah. in terms of, uh, like in the, in the book that, uh, the Gretsch drum book that Rob Cook and, and I, uh, put together, uh, I mean, we have like the whole chronology of badges, um, you know, and in fact, I'm looking at it right now, and uh, and in some cases, they were just like decals. You That's know, funny. That were, uh, yeah, early on, they were just mounted on. But the, um, uh, but yeah, they they did have uh, you know, like there there was this kind of unusual, uh, you know, square badge that said Gretsch American USA and so forth. Uh, but uh, but the round badge that we all know, it's uh, I mean, it was certainly in use by the 30s. We're entering a pretty tricky time in America. Um, the Great Depression, we are approaching, We, if not in World War II at this point. Um, and I know that Gretsch is also coming up on an ownership change, which I want to just say uh, up front to people, if you keep hearing Fred Gretsch over a hundred year span, you're not going crazy. There are multiple Fred Gretches. And- yeah, well, it, it's, it, yeah it, it's, it, it's pretty easy to, to keep straight, actually. I mean, like when I first... Before I knew, I was very confused too. Yeah, you know? exactly. Because 
Because the first thing I'm, I'm thinking, well, how old is this guy? Exactly. That's can't what I thought. Can't be the same Fred Gretsch. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you yeah. know, can't, can't be, you know? No. So, so uh, no, but, uh, I mean, there was the original Frederick Gretsch yep. who came from Germany, and, and he's the guy that started, you know, the Gretsch company in 1883. And then uh, there's his son, Fred Gretsch uh, Sr. Yep. And he's the gentleman that took over his dad's company after his dad passed away. And he's running it and, up until this point that we're talking about, which is kind of where we, we then switch to another Fred. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then, then there's uh, his son, Fred Gretsch Jr. And, uh, and Fred, uh, yeah, Fred Gretsch Jr., he comes in in 1942, um, you know, to, uh, to become company uh, president. Uh, but of course, he once uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor happens, and that drives the U.S. into World War II. And of course, I mean, people were very patriotic back then, and yep. uh, you, you got to defend your country and what you believe in. So um, he joined the Navy, and uh, I believe he quickly rose to the rank of commander. So wow. uh, he, um, yeah, so he uh, he went off to war, and then Fred Jr.'s brother, Bill or William Gretsch, he uh, takes over the company while, uh, while, while Fred, uh, Fred Jr. is uh, at war. And, uh, and Bill Gretsch is the father of today's Fred Gretsch, Fred W. Gretsch. Okay, is, that's uh, interesting. I didn't know that. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fred, uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, Bill Gretsch, Fred W. Gretsch's father, um, he died in uh, in 1948, and I think Fred W. was only like two when his dad died. Gotcha. You know, this is, which is sad, you know. But um, um, yeah. so then during World War II, like most of these companies, which um, I actually talked to Joe Meckler all about in episode two, is the World War II era drums, which Gretsch was obviously uh, involved in with the metal rationing. Um, sure. So they did all that, which if you want to hear more about that stuff, then um, I recommend checking out episode two. Um, I, I, can, I can give you a, a, a little anecdote that you please, probably won't please do. see anywhere else. Yeah, or, love it. The, um, uh, Bill Hagner, who was, um, uh, he worked for Gretsch uh, in Brooklyn starting in 1941 uh, as a foreman. He's still alive. Wow. He's, uh, he lives in Florida, and I think he's in his 90s now. Uh, he told a story about during the war that uh, they actually, uh, just to keep the shop going, uh, that one of the things that they, that they did was they, uh, they built um, uh, waste paper baskets. Really? Like, out of, like they take like a 9 by 13 drum shell oh my and God. put a bottom on it and... You know? That's amazing. Uh, but, but actually, uh, I just remember there is something else that they did during the war. Uh, they they did manufacture stuff for the war effort. They they also built gas masks. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, like you know those long elephant trunk looking things. Yeah, real scary know? looking. Now that <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, and and the thing is, is like the, those those hoses are kind of like reinforced, and because you know Gretsch could build you know drum hoops. Like they would like those hoses were like reinforced with like these little, like little drum hoops. Wow, <laughs> you know, that's that they amazing. Build because because they had and they were made out you know and and you know so like anything made out of wood, you know because they couldn't because they could only use ten percent by content yeah. metal you know so yeah. um, they could use very little metal in there anything that they made unless it was for the war effort because that's why yep. they were conserving metal so they could build bombs and tanks and stuff like that so. But uh, yeah, they. they uh, but I know that one of the things that they, that they built for the war effort were, were gas masks. That's wild. I know. Um, I think uh, Joe was saying that Rogers was making like the instruments that would be in like planes, like the gauges and all that stuff. So it's it's that's really cool drum history to kind of hear about uh, what oh, yeah. what they yeah, were doing. The waste baskets thing is just crazy. Now is that that wasn't like a we're making waste baskets for the war effort. That was just we literally no, no, no. we need to keep the lights on and and sell something. Exactly. Exactly. It, it was just something that they could that they could make to, exactly to, to kind of keep the keep the lights on. Wow. I mean, I'm sure there were other like things, novelties, or what's well, not yeah. a novelty, a novel idea for a drum company. But um, but it's 
you know, but every office needs a waste paper basket. Hey, you know, people got people got garbage. Yeah, exactly. That's amazing. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. All right, so we go through World War Two. What was the? Uh, I completely forget. What is the? They they had though a a war outfit of drums, right? Like what was their? Um, I know there's the the Rolling Bomber. What was Gretsch? What was theirs called? Oh, that's right. Uh, the Defender. The Defender. Cool. Yep. They had some cool yes, names. Uh, yeah, 1942, 1946. Uh, World War II era drums with wooden lugs because the War Production Board had ruled that no more than 10% of the weight of war era drums could be made of critical materials, i.e. metal. So then we get through World War II. Um, I see something noted here that says in 1946 they produced the first uh, production double bass drum for Louis Belson. For Louis Belson, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yep, that's... yep, yep. Yeah, the um, story was was that uh, Louis went to uh, all the drum manufacturers, you know, uh, one by one as he was being turned down. I mean, the drum set, as we know it, and as it was known back then, um, when you think about it, it's still a pretty modern contraption, uh, or fairly new, rather. I mean, it was something that... Uh, I mean, wasn't around that long back then, you know, maybe a couple of decades. So, um, so when he came up with this idea and these plans to build this double bass kit, I mean, all the other companies looked like it looked at him like he had two heads and, you know, just said, no, we're not going to do that. Yeah. No one, no one's going to buy that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, so, um, so then when he brought it to Gretsch, they said, well, why not do that? The thing is, if you've ever seen, um, I mean, they, they built him a number of uh, double bass drum kits throughout the 40s and 50s. Uh, but if you look at the very first one that they built for him, I mean, not only are they, is it a double bass drum kit, they're what would be known in the 1980s as, as power depth, yeah. you know, I mean, <laughs> they're huge. you know. They're 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 not just big around. I mean, you know, they're they're very deep. You know, yeah. and uh, and they were they're the first couple to do that. You know, and then he had this huge, uh, what looks like a cocktail drum, like this very long, tall floor yeah. tom between uh, all the other toms. It's wild. You know, yeah, and the other toms were also kind of unusual sizes. Yeah, and they too. go in a weird so, order. They go kind of like they mm-hmm. sort of start small on the left and then go a little bigger and then you got your mega floor tom and then they kind of yeah. go back down in size. So he's obviously a very revolutionary guy. Um, oh, yeah, and, sure. And he's interesting with getting his start in the Gene Krupa jump, drum competition and all that mm-hmm. really cool stuff, but that's, again, another... Uh, and, and, he, and he was like an absolute gentleman. I met him once um, at Joe Casadas' Modern Drum Shop in New York. Hmm. Uh, I used to go there fairly often, and um, and I was there one day talking to Joe Casadas, and Louis Belson walks in with uh, his manager, and he had just purchased a cymbal, and he w- just wanted the cluster of rivets installed. Yeah, and so there's nobody else in the store, so they go off and start drilling the cymbal and put the rivets in, and there's nobody there except for him and me, you know. So uh, so I introduced myself and say how much I've always admired him and and I can't tell you like how nice he was I mean but not just how nice he was but like from head to to toe he was perfect really I mean his his hair was like perfectly coiffed and like his his skin the 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 clothes he was wearing was wearing this beautiful suit with uh uh what do you call it a camel uh you know, that kind of light brown, yeah. you know, top coat, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and, and it, and he was just like his shoes, you know, like shined perfectly. I mean, oh like, gosh. I mean, like he was, he was meticulous. I mean, and he was so pleasant and he was so without sounding pretentious or, yeah. or, uh, or pompous or any, none of that. I mean, just a, but he was just a perfect gentleman. I mean, like, uh, just, just an amazing guy, but yeah, but he was, he was the first guy with a with a with a double double kick, and uh, and Gretsch was the only company that would build it for him. Wow, so. what a cool story! Because you know, you always you never want to hear that a drummer's a uh, a jerk, and uh, I don't think I need to say the name of who I'm thinking of, uh, who is an amazing drummer but <laughs> gets a little bit of a bad reputation. Um, oh yeah, well I I, I realize that. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm always reminded of. Uh, of the John Lennon quote, which is, uh, meeting your heroes is usually pretty disappointing. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
not have anything to do with Gretsch, but just uh, just as an aside, uh, I've known Hal Blaine yeah. since. Uh, wow. I mean, I've I've known him for over thirty years, and uh, he's another guy that is just like the nicest, the nicest guy wow. in, in the world. He just had know? a birthday. And, yeah, he just turned 90 on February 5th, and uh, I was invited to go, but I just couldn't get away Man. Um, at the Baked Potato in, uh, in North Hollywood. Um, you know, I, 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 I hope it yeah. went well. Every little person you meet, that, that spreads like a kind of a ripple, and they tell two people, and they tell, tell two people, and so that's good to hear. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, exactly. So we are approaching what would be considered um, – the golden era of, uh, of Gretsch, um, mm -hmm. which I'm sure there's multiple, but, um, kind of yeah. before we get there, I know in 48 bill passes away. Right. Okay. Fred W's dad, yeah. Fred W's dad. So then Fred Gretsch jr. Bill's brother, Fred Gretsch jr. Mm -hmm. Went off to war, gave bill the company. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. resumes, he goes back to being in charge. Correct. Right. Mm hmm. Okay, cool. So then, um, so he's in charge when we're entering the 1950s here. Now, am I mm -hmm. skipping anything, or am I? Uh... No. Well, um, well, by 1950, 1949, 1950, uh, that's when uh, Gretsch Hardware starts to change. Uh, like now, you're we're getting into the uh, the streamliner lugs, okay. you know, versus the uh, the rocket lugs lugs that uh, Gretsch was using up to that point. Phil Grant, who I think is a guy that uh, we haven't mentioned yet, um, Phil was uh, what Jimmy Webster was to Gretsch guitars. That's what Phil Grant was to Gretsch drums. You know, he was the drum guy. You know, he um, he was the guy that uh, that was very much involved with uh, uh, you know the. Uh, the endorsers and uh, and the products and stuff like that. So he was, that was kind of like really his his thing. And uh, and he was the guy that that because um, if, if you've ever seen any of those old uh, Gretsch drums with the rocket lugs, you know they're nickel plated and you know they're you know I mean I know that there are some guys out there who say oh yeah well, those are awesome looking you know but he felt that that the hardware should look nicer that it should be chrome plated. In his words, that the drums should have more dignity. You know, it's a yeah. good way to put it. It's a very, it's a very classy era. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like you know, just like you know, and uh, and and that's when you know Gretsch drums really start to look like the Gretsch drums that we know and love. You know, so that kind of mm -hmm. transitions into the the era where people are. I feel like the the playing style even changes. People are getting a little. Uh, mm -hmm. Not heavier. I mean, you're just you're playing more. Your uh, things are being amplified where you need to be a little bit louder than, and you're playing a little bit harder, and the gear needs to be able to handle that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Oh, also, I should mention also around this time is um, um, Gretsch was the first company to make the 20 inch bass drum. Really? You know? Cool. Uh, yeah, Davey Tuff. Uh, he was the guy that uh, that wanted a smaller bass drum because. You know, if you've ever played uh, drums in a city like New York or Chicago or wherever, and you're dealing with cabs and stairs and stuff like that, and back then, you know, bass drums were enormous. They were 24, 26 inches, whatever, in diameter, and it's like, you know, they wouldn't fit in the, in the trunk of a cab, you know, like, even back then when, when cabs were like trucks, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's like drums were just so ridiculously enormous. Drums don't have to be big to sound big. No, exactly. You know? Yeah, because because like you know, even even an eighteen inch bass drum, or in Davy Tuff's case, a twenty inch bass drum. I mean, the eighteen came later, but the the twenty inch bass drum. I mean, that was revolutionary, you know. But I mean, a twenty inch bass drum is still a good size. I mean, oh, that's, yeah. You know, you know, like you, you should be able to do the job with a twenty. Yeah, you know? it's super common um, today. I mean, a lot of people use twenties. Yeah. But back then it was like, you know, nobody played a bass drum that small, you know, yeah. but, but that was kind of like the beginning of like Gretsch being known for like, like putting together the smaller drum kits, you yeah. know, so the bebop uh, kind of sizes. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, and then it wasn't too long afterwards that instead of nine by thirteens, eight by twelves, instead of 
16 by 16 floor toms, 14 by 14s. And then by the early 50s, you know, Max Roach, yep. you know, had his own signature snare drum with Gretsch, which was a 4 by 14. And, uh, you know, which is basically a piccolo snare drum, yeah. you know. And there were, like, a few others. I mean, I know that WFL made a Buddy Rich uh, 3 by 13 snare, which which is pretty cool. It looks like a yeah. flying saucer, you know. Very <laughs> but, progressive, though, it, for that era, obviously. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. In fact, a few years uh, when they stopped calling it the Max Roach uh, uh, signature snare drum, they, they started calling it the pro- progressive jazz snare drum. Well, there you so, go. <laughs> uh, you know, so there you go. Like, from from, uh, from your mouth to uh, yeah. to the Gretsch catalog. Exactly. So. <laughs> that's, that's the way it goes. <laughs> Yeah. Jump, jumping around a little bit, what is the involvement of the Fred Gretsch company with Zildjian? Because I, I did a, a whole history on Zildjian that I've, I've, I didn't release and I haven't done anything with it yet. But there is, I can't remember if it's A or K or what they owned the rights to in America. Uh, it was, uh, well, it was, it was, it was K. Um, let me just, because uh, I know that it was in, uh, in 1926. Okay. Yeah, in the summer of 1926, the company acquired all rights to the K. Zildjian Symbol Company. Now, if and if you know anything about Zildjian, you know that they didn't move from Turkey to America until 1929. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, so, and then that's a whole thing. And then then they would release them as A, and then yeah, that's a whole fascinating. Uh, Thing and there's actually court documents that you can find of them suing each other, trying to get or, or Zildjian suing Gretsch, trying to get the rights back um, for years. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. You know, um, yeah. Uh, in in the book that um, that Rob and I wrote, I mean, uh, there is a section uh, that that's covered. You know about the the whole because because it it to a lot of people it is uh, it is very. Very, uh, very confusing. It was extremely you know, confusing. So. Just getting that in people's minds that that uh, Gretsch controlled the American distribution rights uh, for Zildjian yeah. back, mm-hmm. way back. So, um, mm-hmm. okay, well, we can spend hours on this. So let's try and push forward here. Um, all right, so yeah. we're we're in the fifties. So we got Max Roach in 1950. I'm clicking along here. We got ni- and then uh, Max Roach 50. Art Blakey comes on in 1954. So they have they're in the the public eye as being this kind of uh, mm-hmm. progressive, again, progressive jazz drumming kind of world, which is obviously a very rock and roll wasn't exactly sweeping the nation quite yet. No. 60s, we get, we get, we're going through the 60s. Tony Williams comes on, obviously, with his uh, very famous yellow Gretsch drum set that everyone knows. Um, <coughs> the relationship with Birdland Studios is happening in. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah, sure. Yes. Well, I think the, the, the yellow um, Tony Williams kid, I think that came later. Oh, but but as a kid, he started playing Gretsch drums like in 1959 when he was like 15 years old. Really? So, okay. So, yeah, yeah, so uh, he was, he was. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if he was an official endorser then, but I know that he started playing them. Uh, and uh, I actually have some original Gretsch drumhead boxes with the drumhead still in them from uh, the 60s that mentions um, Tony Williams as an endorser. Cool. Only back then he was called Anthony huh. Williams. Wow. You know, and That's it's funny. Just, it, it's just funny to see that. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So then 1967, we enter, you, you mentioned it before, um, Fred Gretsch Jr. retires. And uh, then, so he's, yeah. he sells to Baldwin, which is the first major sale of the, uh, of the company. Yeah, well, at that time, uh, well, in the 60s, well, the thing is, is that let's not forget the Beatles. The Beatles absolutely revolutionized the MI business. There's, you can't possibly underestimate, when you spoke to Bill, uh, Bill Ludwig III yep. about Ludwig, the phones were ringing off the hook the next day after they appeared on Ed Sullivan. Yeah. Well, with Gretsch, George Harrison played a Gretsch country gentleman guitar, and it oh, was wow. the same thing. That's amazing. Because the thing is, is that these companies, you know, when they order supplies like lumber and stuff that they need to build their instruments, they base their orders on the previous year. Like, say, let's say in the case of a drum company, well, last year we ordered like these many rims and these many lugs and so forth and so on. And, you know, with guitar parts, it's the same thing. You order this much lumber and tuning pegs and pickups and so forth. And you forecast what you think you're going to do in the following year. Yeah. So, you know, the Beatles happen 
and nobody sees this coming, you know, and it's, and, and all of a sudden everything just goes topsy. And, um, you know, so, so for Gretsch, I mean, you know, they had country gentlemen's in stock, but after the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan, they were very soon out of stock. Mm. And, and then the country gentlemen's, I mean, I heard that, you know, they were back ordered for two years, but that kind of sounds like an exaggeration. But, yeah. but one thing that I know that isn't is uh, Dan Duffy uh, is a guy that I know that uh, worked for Gretsch back in the day. Uh, and, um, and he was on the guitar side. And he said that before the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan in 1964, prior to that, we were building 17, maybe 20 guitars a day. But after that, we were building 75 to 100 guitars a day. Wow. So yeah. if, if you think of, so you figure what was going on with the guitars, I mean, it was probably this, the, the drum manufacturing was probably augmented in, in the same way. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, is that not everybody was like kind of, you know, brand oriented. Yeah. I think, um, I think that there were, a lot of people that just wanted a drum set. Yeah, I want to be a drummer. Or an like, electric yeah. guitar. Yeah. Or something that they could afford, you yeah. know? Yeah. So, and because like the, 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 uh, the interview you did with the MIJ drums, mm -hmm. exactly. you know, Man in Japan. Yep. I mean, that stuff just took off because exactly. you could buy a, a Japanese made drum set for, you know, a fraction of what you'd pay for a U.S. made kit, you yeah. know? So, so, then that explosion happens. It's then interesting to me that why did Gretsch sell to Baldwin in 67? What was the, the, well, yeah. That? Um, well, what, well, what was going on? The other trend that was happening was that all these big corporations were taking notice of these little mom and pop musical instrument companies like Leo Fender and, and Fred Gretsch and, uh, and Joseph Rogers, and they were, they were saying like, well, there's, there's a lot of money in, in now there is yeah. in musical instruments. Um, so we had all these big corporations buying these companies. I mean, in 1965, CBS bought Fender. They bought Fender for, um, for $15 million. Hmm. Now, two years earlier, CBS bought the New York Yankees for $13 million. Oh, wow. That kind of puts it in perspective. Yeah. I mean, that, that shows you like what kind of money there was to be made at the time. Yeah. You know, when, when this was going on. So Baldwin, 67 to 85, um, kind of jumping ahead here for, for time's yeah. sake, are they, did quality dip or was it, was, did it remain pretty consistent? Well, after Baldwin uh, bought Gretsch uh, for, $4 million. Um, what happened was um, they decided to move manufacturing from Brooklyn to Boonville, Arkansas, because Baldwin owned a banjo factory hmm. in Boonville, Arkansas. It was really a, like a converted barn. Wow. And so they moved everything by rail in the summer of 69. And they, and they, the reason why they moved it in the summer is because you know, a lot of people go on vacation, you know, Retail slow, you know, people go away. Not many people are buying musical instruments that time of year, so they figured, well, that's a good time to to make the move. So, yeah. um, so they 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 moved everything, and they got Bill Hagner um, to uh, to set up the uh, the factory in in Boonville, and um, and you know, and hire people off the small towns and farms and the immediate area and treat and uh, teach them craftsmanship and all that. But, you know, it takes a while to get good at building that stuff. And, oh, yeah. Uh, there was certainly a dip in the... Uh, uh, I don't hear too many people complaining about the drums from that era. Um, I hear mostly about the, the guitars, you know, uh, from that era. Now, not to say that everything was bad back then, you know, but... Um, yeah, but it changed a little bit. It, it it did, you know, and um, and it's sort of like, you know, what happens when one company buys another, you know, yeah. it's like, well, well, we got to pay off this note. So, um, 
how can we make it cheaper and charge more money for it? Yeah, you know? exactly. So, well, you know, to help pay off the note. So, um, although actually, in, in the case of Gretsch, it's probably not true because because uh, I was told by uh, by uh, by Fred Gretsch that um, that Baldwin uh, paid cash. Oh boy. For Gretsch, you know, so uh, they, yeah. so uh, so I not, guess they didn't have a note to pay. But that no. doesn't mean that other companies, like you know, when Norlin bought Gibson or Avnet bought Guild, or you know, but that was a trend that was definitely going on in the '60s. These corporations were buying up these small music companies, these family-owned music companies. Now, very uh, similar to the Ludwig story, there is a triumphant return of the Gretsch family to the yep. ownership. So Fred W. Gretsch, son of mm-hmm. Bill. Who is the son of the original uh, of Fred Senior? Correct. Um, yeah. He gets the company back in the family in 1985. Yeah. He. Um, let me just preface it with a little story. Um, in 1967, when Fred W. Gretsch was 21 years old, his uncle Fred Gretsch Jr. took him out to Peter Luger's, which is a steakhouse right down the street, uh, which has been there since 1887. Sure. The Gretsch family still has a table there. Oh, every every cool. year for my birthday, I, I, I go there and sit at the Gretsch table. Nice, that's awesome. Uh, so anyway, but um, the thing is, is that uh, but he took he took young Fred out to lunch and said, "I've sold the company, you know, to Baldwin," and and young Fred says, uh, "Yeah, but I I wanted to own it." Of course. And uh, and he said, "Yeah, well, 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 Baldwin paid cash for it," and uh, and he says, "We're going to be working for Baldwin from now on." But Fred W. swore that day that he would, that he would one day be able to to get the company back, wow. you know, into family ownership. Which he did. It took him took him seventeen years, but he did it because every time uh, he approached Baldwin, the answer was always no. But the the ironic thing is what happened. Baldwin by that time had gotten into investments. They became the Enron of their day. Oh, really? So they had to pay off the bank. I mean, the bank was calling Baldwin. You know, they were calling in the loan. Yeah. They weren't calling just to say hi. You know, they yeah, were give me my money. Exactly. So, so basically, uh, they had to sell everything off in order to pay off their debt. And Duke Kramer, who uh, who had been with Gretsch since 1935, uh, I mean, he had retired a few years earlier by the, by this time. He caught wind about this and contacted Fred W. And he set up a meeting. Uh, Fred officially bought the company back, I believe, in November of 84, and then announced it to the world on uh, January 1st of 85 that uh, the company was now family-owned again. Now, do you know what he, uh, uh, do, we, do we know what he paid for the company? Uh, I didn't ask, and I wasn't told. Well, it's it's good. It's back in in family hands, and I'm sure it's uh it's whatever it was. It's it's worth getting it back. So, all right. So then we're we're kind of getting in the modern times here, and I think we should kind of mm-hmm. bring it on home. And I know there's um, KMC Music. They become uh, the distributor worldwide. Yeah, they they, they become uh, the distributor uh, for Gretsch Drums in 2000. It's basically a licensing deal. Mm. You know where they're uh, they don't own the name, but you know they they take care of the day to day the the distribution, and yeah, the, you know, stores, the and service, and all that stuff. Yeah, it's, gotcha. it's sort of like a like a sales force for hire. You know, kind of like a broker. You yeah, know? command at that time was really you know huge, and they were very good at at percussion. You know, because they owned LP, yeah. Gibraltar Hardware, and so forth, and so they you know CB and all that stuff. So you know they they had it together and and. And also, they had great connections uh, overseas, you know, with manufacturers, you know, to introduce more affordable import lines of Gretsch drums and so forth. And, uh, you know, that's when that happened. And actually, a couple of years later, uh, Fred did the same thing with uh, Fender. Same thing, a licensing deal yeah. for the guitars, you know. So, And the funny thing is, is that, um, so in 2000, Fred does a distribution deal with command for the drums and then 2002 2003 he does the same thing with fender for the guitars and then in 2007 the end of 2007 fender buys command for 117 million dollars in oh, cash my god wow so the funny thing is is that this nobody could have foreseen this but by the end of 2007 gretsch drums and gretsch guitars 
are under the Fender umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> <My gosh. laughs> because now they own Command, which distributes Gretsch drums. Yeah. So. Uh, so it's just a, an interesting uh, thing. So from from that 2000, 2007, the, these these acquisitions, there's different lines coming out. But I think, um, which is a whole th- thing. But I think keeping it on track here, 2015, DW, they come into the into the picture. Okay, yeah. Um, actually, it was December 23rd, 2014, that the deal is done. But I can tell you what what led up to that. Yeah, please do. Okay, uh, in 2000, 2014, a company called Texas Pacific Group buys Fender. And the first thing that Texas Pacific Group decides is let's dump KMC. Interesting. So they try to sell KMC for $50 million. Now keep in mind that Fender bought KMC for $117 million. Yeah, that's a, quite a but, loss. But that, but, that, but that wasn't Texas Pacific Group's money. That was Fender's money. Yeah. So they don't care. Yeah. So let's just unload it for $50 million, get rid of it, and move on. But there's no takers. No, not even for $50 million does anybody want to buy KMC. So um, from what I heard, what happens at this point when there's, they just can't sell it, DW raises their hand and they say, well, we're interested in the drum brands. Yeah. So, and that includes exclusive distribution of Gretsch drums, uh, ownership of Gibraltar, Latin percussion, uh, what is it? Percussion plus or yeah. pro percussion, whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, and, uh, cat electronic drums and CB drums and, you know, a few other lesser brands, uh, that KMC owned. Uh, and, and again, I don't know. I wasn't told. I didn't ask. Yeah. So I don't know what DW got it for. Yeah. And then what was left of KMC went to a company in Canada, another musical uh, distributor in Canada called Jam Industries. Hmm. But KMC still exists today, and they still function as they always have. They've taken on a lot of other new brands to kind of recover from from the the losses. Yeah. They're they're. Very nice people at, at KMC. I, I know those those people very well, and uh, they're they're terrific people. Well, and then my my only question, um, moving with the DW thing, would be, what is the role of Fred W. Gretsch? And compared to, is he still he still owns the name Gretsch? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, a, 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 absolutely. I mean, okay. it's, and that's the way it's always been. No matter whether it was KMC or Fender, you know, uh, it's or Hal Leonard, you know, yeah. Because uh, Hal Leonard, as of uh, uh, mid 2017, they took on uh, Gretsch Import Drums, which is renowned Catalina Club, Catalina yeah. Maple, yeah. and Energy. They they took on you know all the the Gretsch Import lines as well as Gibraltar Hardware and Cat Electronic Drums and. Uh, you know all the 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 former uh, brands that uh, that KMC had. Well, and the the Catalina line itself is is just inexpensive drums, but they are amazing. I mean, I I owned a, a practice little extra kit of a Catalina mod kit I got when I was teaching at Sam Ash, and I um, got yeah. a good deal on it. It was awesome. It had a really cool, unique bass drum size, and for the price, I paid like three hundred dollars. They are yeah. great, yeah. inexpensive drums. Obviously, they have all price ranges of drums, but, um, I love the thing. Oh yeah, sure. Well, it's, they, they have a, they have a price point for, you know, for every budget. Uh, I'll let you in on something. Um, this book that, uh, that Rob Cook and I did, you know, the Gretsch drum book, which yeah. came out in 2013, which pretty much has all the information you'd ever want to know about Gretsch, at least up to 2013 when it came out. Yeah. Um, it, you know what the hardest part for me of, of 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 doing that book was what the time that KMC owned it really because so many things came and went so quickly including drum lines and sizes and colors and you know it's like there were more changes in the 14 years that KMC uh distributed Gretsch than all the changes that Gretsch went through in the 20th century. <laughs> that's I mean, hysterical. Wow. You yeah, know, from it, 2000 it was, to 2014. Was, that's amazing. It, it was so difficult to keep up with because like I'm a, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm a Gretsch expert. If I'm knowledgeable about Gretsch drums 
and I'm getting confused, then <laughs> there's an what, issue. What what does the average guy on the street that wants to buy a drum set, yeah. you know, I mean, going to be? I mean, he's going to be. Yeah. Well, what's really? the difference between Marquee and Catalina Maple and you know and and new classic and you know and and, and these are like deadlines, by the way. You exactly. know, like, I mean, oh yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, Marquee only lasted a year, That's and so that was funny. KMC's last year. So wow. Yeah, just really. I mean, oh my goodness! It was like, I mean, in fact, I, I, I when we had lunch with Fred uh, in November, I told him that story. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and 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 I, and I and I said that's one of the things that I'm so glad about what DW did is like, you know, they just got rid of strip it away, they shaved away. Yeah. All, they they just kept the four lines, the four import lines that sold, and then and then of course you know then there's USA quality. I mean, you know, there's the you got the Brooklyn series that came out in 2012. You got the broadcaster series that came out in 2000 at the end of 2014 into 2015 and they're tremendous you know in fact i've got a, a broadcaster kit on order for myself right now so uh nice. i'm looking to get that because uh yeah that'll that'll be my first uh, you know brand new three ply kit wow so i'm i'm, I'm looking i'm looking to, i'm so looking forward to that kit the love you know? continues and i, I think that's a perfect Absolutely. segue to, to say uh mm-hmm. So 2019, we are in the 136th year of Gretsch, which is unbelievable. Yep. Um, you said it multiple times, and I should have said it at the top, but I want people to know that, um, John, you have you co-wrote the Gretsch book mm-hmm. with our friend Rob Cook. Um, Rob Cook, yep. Folks can go out and find that. Pretty much, I, I'd say just Google it and you will find it. Um, it is mm-hmm. a great resource for everything Gretsch. Um, mm-hmm. I think... What we got here today is a very wonderful, in-depth look at all, everything to do with Gretsch, which I, I am fascinated with, and I feel now that I know a thousand percent more than I did before. So I thank you so much. Okay, for, well, uh, I'm, I'm 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 glad that uh, that you got something out of it. Oh, and, this uh, was great. <clears throat> go Gretsch, you know uh, yeah. that that great Gretsch sound, that great Gretsch gravitas. You know, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely the thing. You know, um, and uh, and uh, if any of your listeners are in the Northeast, um, you know, I, I do all the drum shows in the Northeast. The, uh, the Delaware drum show is um, uh, coming up. It's yeah. uh, February, February 24th. And then there's the Connecticut drum show in, uh, it's, uh, in Newington uh, on April 14th. And then there's the Pennsylvania drum show uh, in Selins Grove. Uh, and that is October 19th. That's awesome. So, uh, and I do all these shows, and uh, I also have copies of the book there. Cool. The hardcover version, nice. which you can't get online, so uh, keep that in mind. Cool. Well, I recommend people go up to you. You're a, you're a nice guy, and I don't think you'll, uh, oh, you'll, thank you. you'll bite if they come up and talk to you and say, hey, I heard you on Drum History. John, okay. I really appreciate it, man. I'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your day, and, uh, and I hope to see you at one of the drum shows down the, uh, down the road. Okay, sure. Yeah, no, no, no problem, and... Uh, you know, and uh, it's real pleasure talking to you. Uh, it's 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 great what you do, and I'm I'm looking forward to listening to your other other podcasts. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Very welcome, John. You okay. have yourself a good day. Thank you, my friend. You too, man. Sure. Right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.